Good evening and welcome. Glad you are able to join us this evening. Uh, again, if you haven't seen the informational meeting regarding church next week, I ask you that ask for you to go ahead and watch that. If you have any questions, feel free to call the church. My cell phone, text me, email me, message me on Facebook. Uh, message us on Facebook so that uh, we can answer those questions. We have already got a few people that have messaged us and are wanting to come next week uh, to church. And we thank you for your input. We look forward to seeing you all next week, uh, next Sunday morning. And so uh, we encourage you to let us know how, so we know how many are coming. So uh, if we get close to 50, then we may end up having to split the group into two groups so that we are in maintaining guidelines. Um, also, we are going to be providing a children's church uh, slash nursery next Sunday as well. So we look forward to that. So if, let us know also if you have kids, let us know about that so we know how many kids to plan for downstairs so that uh, we are within guidelines as well. Again, if you have prayer requests, please put them in the comment section. Please be in prayer for those that we mentioned uh, this morning, Paul, Paul Shortle, as he's dealing with acute leukemia. Also, deal, uh, pray for David, uh, Chicky's grandson, as he is dealing with uh, looking for a job during this time. And then uh, continue to pray for those who have um, who were involved in a car accident yesterday and passed away here in the town. Um, pray for that family as uh, they are grieving the loss of a loved one. And so, again, if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comments. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to continue our study in the Psalms. So if you would take your Bible, turn to Psalm 62. Psalm 62. And as we have mentioned this morning, uh, we're in a uh, miniature series here in the Psalms. Psalm 60. Uh, we're dealing with Book 2, Psalm 42 through 72. And so, but here in this particular instance, Psalm 61, 62, and 63 are a group of psalms dealing with the same theme, uh, dealing with how are we to trust in God through adversity, resting assuredly in his loving kindness. And so as we look through these things, 61 was the low point, 62 is the middle section, Psalm 63 is the high point of these three psalms. And so we're in 62. Uh, this evening, uh, and this psalm is going to show us how God brings forth spiritual fruit in our lives through adversity. So again, David is going to show us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how spiritual fruit is brought forth in our lives through adversity. But if you also know, adversity itself doesn't create spiritual fruit. And we know of people who, uh, after dealing through adversity, uh, come forth on the other side, much closer to God, more enlightened with his image. But we also know of people that have become bitter through adversity. And the difference is, is God's work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of that person using the adversity to hammer out their character. And this Psalm 62 helps us see how God uses adversity to craft someone uh, into more of his likeness. In fact, David, again, is in trouble in this psalm. But we can see that in verse 3 where he asks the question, how long will he imagine mischief against the man. He had moves from this situation of trouble and begins to reflect on God in that situation. And David is interesting in this psalm as he preaches to himself, he preaches to us, and then he makes application as any good preacher. So he preaches to himself, preaches to us, and then he makes the application at the end. So David is going first through his adversity, reflecting on God, and then he reflects on God in the midst of that adversity, and then he convinces himself to know what he means to be true about God. So these are things that we are going to look at this evening. And so as we look at that, let us look at Psalm 62. To the chief musician, to Jeduthun, 
a psalm of David. For truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in his lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We need you. We need your word. Father, we are tired. We are weary. Uh, we have dealt with many things over the last few weeks. We are weak and we are in need of your word this evening. Father, teach us who you are tonight. Teach us who we, uh, what we are to believe tonight about you. Father, help us, as especially if we're in the midst of adversity and troubling times, that we will see how you use these times uh, to mold us and to make us for your glory. We thank you for these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, this psalm is essentially about the Christian experience and his soul trust in God. David is emphasizing that God is our only hope, and that it is this God who we must place our trust and hope in. But it's interesting because this psalm does not address God directly, which is unusual. Most psalms address God directly, but this psalm only addresses God directly by way of almost like an inscription at the very end. He says there at the very end, O Lord, belong mercy, O Lord, thy loving kindness. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is yours. In fact, much of this psalm is that David is speaking to himself rather than speaking to God. He's reminding himself. He's actually preaching to himself, and then he preaches to us, and then he makes the application at the end. But even though David is not addressing God directly, this psalm is very much God-centered as he preaches to himself and he preaches to us. We understand a little bit about the circumstances because David brings that in for us in the beginning of the psalm. But more or less, this is David coaching himself, preaching himself up, and doing the same for us as we think about adversity and how we are to handle this adversity. This psalm is uh, easily broken down into three stanzas, separated by the word selah. And so you have verses 1 through 4, it ends in selah. Verses 5 through 8, that ends in Selah, and then verses 9 through 12. So we have here in the first section, verses 1 through 4, silent trust in God. Silent trust in God. And before we actually get into the body of the message, we must take a look at uh, the inscription there to the chief musician to Jeduthun. 
This is similar to what we would see in our hymnals, because oftentimes when people would write hymns, uh, they would attribute that particular poem to also the tune to that individual. Uh, for instance, when you sing Rock of Ages, which is a fairly well-known hymn, the tune of that hymn is called Toplady, which is the last name of the person who wrote the hymn and wrote the tune. And so this instance is very similar to that uh, song or that hymn called Rock of Ages in which Jaduthan is the name of the worship leader. And this is uh, the tune to which we would sing, or the Jews would sing, Psalm 62. So that is dealing with the inscription. But David, again, is in trouble. We often find David uh, fairly regularly in the Psalms. He's in trouble. He's facing adversity. And he's surrounded by enemies. He sees men in high places committing injustice. He sees both lowly men and men of high rank uh, dealing and engaging in evil and wickedness. He sees people oppressing others. He sees people stealing. And David's soul is oppressed by what he is watching, both rich and poor, both uh, intellectuals and uneducated. All of these people are en enamored with evil and wickedness. And so you begin to see in verse 1, he says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. What we don't see in the translation, though, is in the word waiteth has the idea of waiting in silence. So the, the first verse could be rendered this way. My soul waits in silence upon God. From him cometh my salvation. Our soul is waiting in silence, David says. David, we're seeing a silent trust in God. David, in the very depth of his being, silently puts his trust in God. He doesn't complain. He doesn't murmur. He is surrounded by enemies. He doesn't complain that God's forgotten him. He doesn't complain that the Lord has forgotten him. But he goes and trusts in God silently in this situation. David, notice with me in verse 1, realizes that his salvation can only come from God. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because it's going to come up again later in the psalm. David realizes that his salvation can come only from God. And so after he announces in verse 1, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation, as we said before, waiting in silence. That's key for this, waiting in silence. David begins to contemplate God's character. He contemplates God's nature. He says three things about God. He says that God is my rock. God is his salvation and God is his uh, defense. Or as he normally says in other Psalms, his stronghold. And these are wonderful images for a man who is surrounded by evil, who thinks that they're going to come after him. David is picturing God as a rock. As, as, as if he's in the wilderness and that there's huge boulders between him and the enemies. He thinks that God is his salvation. The one who's going to rescue him from the hands of his enemies. And then he thinks about God, who is his defense or his stronghold. So you have a rock, you have his salvation, and you have his defense. Is it any wonder when we think of the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, this is similar to what David is experiencing here in Psalm 62, as we would sing about in Psalm 46. So David is thinking about who God is, and his focus is on God despite the circumstances. Yes, he sees what's going on around him. He makes mention of the fact that what's going on around him in verses 3 and 4, and you can look at that with me here for a moment. 
How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in his lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. The, the picture is of this group of people in a dark room or in a back alley conspiring to take out David. As is of David as a leaning wall getting ready to be pushed over. And so these evil men see David at his very breaking point or conspire against him to just push him over as a tumbling wall or a leaning wall. For David, evil is ruthless. Evil sees David as weak, and so what evil does is they go to the weak and uh, crush the weak. And instead of attempting to aid the person who is weak, attempt now to crush the weak. This is evil. This is how David describes the wicked who have surrounded him. But after seeing these things, seeing how the enemies are there in verse 3 through 5. Look what David says again in verse 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. Again, the word wait is there. And again, we understand it. It can be translated as wait in silence for God only. So what does the word silence mean that is not given to us in our translation? What is this idea of silence in this passage of Scripture? The silence here means an unmurmuring submission to God's will. So in essence, you're not murmuring or complaining, but you have submitted yourself to God's will. Very opposite of what we see in Exodus through Deuteronomy, right? As the children of Israel going through the wilderness, we constantly see them and hear them and read about them murmuring and complaining, murmuring and grumbling. And David says, I'm going to wait in silence. I will have submission to your will. I will not grumble about what God's doing based on his providence in my life. Instead, David says, I will in silence wait. He will not murmur against God's will. In this particular context, David realizes that the grace of God is his only source of strength and hope. He says to himself and he says to us tonight, my soul waits in silence for God only. Isn't it grace to realize we need God's grace in our lives this evening? Isn't it God's grace in our lives to realize that it is salvation is holy from God? Isn't it grace to realize that God is pouring his grace in our lives to help us realize that our help is from the Lord? Isn't it grace in our lives to help us realize that God is our rock, God is our strength, God is our defense? Because it's our natural Inclination, our, our natural ability is to do what? To run to something else or to someone else before we run to God to understand that he is our sole hope. And it is grace to realize that God's grace alone can save us. The person that has God's grace at work in his heart finds God. David realized that it's only by the grace of God that God is his only source of hope.
And that is grace in our lives when we realize that through certain trials, circumstances, adversities in our life, that the only place we can turn to is God himself because God is the only one who can provide the source of strength and hope during that time. And that the only reason we are able to see that is because of God's grace. That's where exactly where David is. And David is saying to himself, you are my only hope. David doesn't have a strategy to get out. There's nothing in this passage of scripture that says David has a military plan to get out of Dodge. There's nothing in this passage of scripture that shows that David is going to strategize to get out. David says, I don't have a defense, I don't have a plan, I don't have a strategy, but God alone. That's the first thing that we learned this evening, that David's trust is in God, and it's a silent trust. It is an unmurmuring submission to God's will. And because of that, we understand that it is a grace of God that works in his heart, to show him that an all-sufficient God is all you need. So we, David silently trusts in God in verses 1 through 4. And then it gets even better because he patiently waits. Or he patiently trusts God in verses 5 through 8. Now David is reminding us in the first four verses that it's a silent trust in God. He doesn't murmur. He doesn't grumble against God's promises. Now he's patiently waiting on this same God to get him out of these circumstances. David is talking to himself in verses 1 through 4. He's dealing with us in verses 5 through 8. Think about it, verses 5 through 7. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. He's waiting for God to appear. He's waiting for God to deliver. He's waiting for God to answer prayer. And then you get to verse 8 and he says, Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. David is essentially telling us tonight to wait and to trust. Or we can even label it have patience and have faith. David is telling himself and he's telling us this evening that God's ways are not your ways. God's timing is not your timing. God's plan hasn't been revealed to you. God's plan may not be revealed to you. How is God going to use this circumstance in my life? David says, if your hope is really in him, then you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to silently submit yourself to God's will. Because in reality... We're going to have to realize that God is good, God is wise, God is all sufficient. David's, it's entirely interesting that after dealing with the enemies in verses 3 through 4, David's enemies have vanished in verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> David has lost himself in God and forgot about the circumstances of life. And the situations that are so troubling, the circumstances that are heavy, don't seem so troubling anymore. They're lost because he's lost in God. He's looking to our God. If we have many enemies, if we have many troubles, if we have many circumstances, many temptations, we need to do like David is and lose ourselves in God. 
Because as we lose ourselves in God, we find out that God is so much bigger, so much greater, so much stronger, so much wiser than the circumstances that are before us. David's knowledge of who God is is his pathway out of the circumstances. It's his, his trail leading to his refuge. That's why it's so important to know who God is, his character, his nature, his promises. Because as we find ourselves in life storms and in life's adversities, we need to know that we can find our greatest hope, our greatest strength in God alone. Because that's the Bible is telling us about who God is. It's how we get to a point of finding refuge in God. Because we can't enjoy refuge in God if we don't know who God is. If we don't know that God is our rock, how do we find anything in life to find an anchor point in the storm? If we don't know who God is, where are we going to find peace? If we don't know where, who God is, where are we going to find joy? If we don't know who God is, where are we going to find mercy? If we don't know who God is, where are we going to find grace? And the list can go on and on. Because in reality, we cannot enjoy the rock, we cannot enjoy the defense, we can't enjoy the stronghold unless we know who God is. Psalm 62, verse 7. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. <clears throat> and he understands this, and then he brings it back and he talks to us, the reader, and he says, to Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. <clears throat> he says, pour out your heart to God. We are to be as David, silently waiting. Not murmuring, not grumbling, not complaining. David is calling for us, the reader, those of us who sang this psalm, to do two things, and that is to trust him and to pray to him. He says in the verse, saying to the, in the second verse, I shall not greatly be moved. But in the second stanza, or verses 5, through seven or five through eight, I shall not be moved. He grows, I may be shaken. And then the second stanza, he says, I'm not going to be moved at all. I won't be shaken. Because he has learned to trust in God. Because God is his only source of hope and faith and trust. But he preaches these two things for us, patience and hope faith and trust, and then he makes application because of the power and goodness of God. He says there in verses 9 through 10, surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon him. The picture is, the foe is being weighed out on a scale. Some men are lowly. Some men are great. But if you put them in the scales and you put God on the other side, you know what happened? God always outweighs them. They never measure up. As it says in Daniel, they are found in the balance and they're found wanting. David is reminding us of the bigness and the goodness and the greatness of God and who he is. Because he realizes that in verses 11 and 12, we see power and we see the loving kindness of God at work. He says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power 
belongeth unto God. David is surrounded by powerful men. He can cave at the illusion that these men are mightier than God. In our own day and age, power, we think sometimes power resides in the president. Sometimes we think power resides in the governor. Sometimes the power relies in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. But David says sole power belongs to God. Christ reminds us of this himself when he tells us in Matthew 28 that all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And he tells us to what? Go ye therefore to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That not only is God power belong, not only does power belong to God, but he also says. That his loving kindness, his mercy, his has said belongs to God. <clears throat> our enemies, our fallen world, our hurt, our pain, our difficult situations must be measured in the balance, put in the scale like David has. Put all of these things in the scale and put God on the other side and always see that God always comes out. Bigger and better. David has told us how to experience God in adversity. Through silently trusting in him. Being patient. Waiting on God. Having faith and trust in him. For he is all powerful. He is all merciful. He is our source of hope and strength. And David is telling us this evening to trust in God and pour our heart out to him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the services today. We thank you for your word. Father, help us as your children to realize that you are all sufficient. That we do not need anything else but you and you alone. Father, forgive us of our unbelief. Forgive us of our faithlessness. Father, help us to find our rest, our hope, and our strength in you. And these things we ask in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Again, uh, before we end, make sure you reach out to us. Let us know if you're coming next week so we know how many people to plan for. And also, for the ladies' Bible study, that is this Saturday from 9 to 10 30 a.m. will be held in person here at the church. We look forward to seeing you all Wednesday at 6 o'clock here on Facebook Live.